Is it okay? Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me like that, or do I need to move the mic a bit closer? Okay. I'm very excited to present our work today to you uh, here and online. And indeed, it's mainly concerned with enhancers. So just a very quick run through. You know, you know that these elements are crucial for gene control in time and space. And the amazing feature is that they can localize quite far away from the genes they control, right? And uh, this is an, perhaps a more extreme example of a sonic hedgehog uh, enhancer, which sits about one megabase away from the target gene, and uh, very confusingly also sits in an intron of another gene. And this enhancer is absolutely crucial for uh, the sonic hedgehog expression in the developing uh, limb bud, and actually for limb formation. So snakes don't have this enhancer, and they don't have limbs. Uh, deleting this enhancer in uh, mice causes limbless mice, and even point mutations uh, of this enhancer in humans uh, cause uh, polydactyly. I'm not going to talk about this enhancer, but this is just to reinforce, you know, that enhancers that localize really far away from their target genes are very important uh, for uh, gene control. And so how do they do this? Uh, I think the convention at the moment is that there, there needs to be some kind of physical contact in most cases between the enhancer and the promoter, either through direct chromosomal loops or perhaps through other mechanisms such as phase separation. I'm not going to go into the details uh, of what controls and how these uh, contacts actually uh, are formed through what mechanistic uh, link, uh, but kind of more globally, we have three important events in enhancer function. We have the enhancer activation in cis, right, uh, locally, uh, which uh, manifests itself through uh, the acquisition of active chromatin marks and chromatin accessibility of the enhancer. Uh, we have some means of uh, enhancer promoter communication, and then we have uh, the target gene induction. So I'm showing these three events in this order, but actually, the relationship between these events and the order of, of these events is not very well understood still. People have obviously been inquiring into that for a long time, and uh, uh, I think uh, we and others have performed quite a lot of correlative analysis where we looked at these three modalities, enhanced activation, enhanced promoter connection, and uh, target gene expression uh, through um, you know, different tissues and conditions. And the answer is quite inconclusive. You know, sometimes these events happen at the same time, and sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes you may have pre-existing enhancer promoter contacts that persist, you know, before and after an enhancer is activated, and sometimes these things go hand in hand. So obviously the next logical step methodologically is to do some kind of perturbation experiments to, as we call, dissect what's going on. Uh, perhaps when I say perturbations, you guys are thinking about artificial perturbations such as CRISPR targeting or the knockouts, the depletions of uh, transcription factors that bind to these enhancers. And I mean, we do that, but I'm not going to talk about it today. What I'm going to talk about to you is perturbations by natural genetic variation. So the patterns of natural genetic variation. Enhancers, first of all, are very important because enhancers are enriched for disease-associated variants uh, revealed by genome-wide association studies. But we can also just leverage them as the kind of nature's mutagenesis screen, to follow the term from Heinz et al., from Chris Wassler. And so that's what we are trying to do, right? So we're going to probe the relationship between enhanced activity, connectivity, and gene expression by leveraging natural genetic variants at enhancers. So what we decided to do is we're going to fix one modality. So we're going to focus entirely, almost entirely, on variants that are known by previous analysis to affect distal gene expression. Now, a bit of terminology, because I know that this terminology is incredibly confusing. These variants are called expression quantitative trait loci, or EQTLs. To my, to my mind, this is quite an old-fashioned and rather impenetrable term, but I'm going to stick to it. Yes, yeah, so by an EQTL, I mean something where one allele of a variant, for example, we have a homozygous individual. Uh, there's a box plot on the right, and I can use the pointer, but people online will not see that. Right? So, um, you know, one a homozygous for this allele will have that level of gene expression, a heterozygous a bit more, and a homozygous minor for even more, right? So that is an EQTL. So this variant that this enhances is an EQTL for this gene, and this gene is often called an EG for this EQTL. Um, I'm also going to use the term QTLs, which are enhancers, or oh, sorry, variants associated with some other phenotypes, which may be molecular phenotypes, such as, for example, looping or enhancer activity. 
So we have inQTLs, the expression QTLs, and we have just QTLs for other things. Okay. So then the question becomes, do these variants also affect other modalities? For example, then we know the effect gene expression, right? We know the acetate enhancer. Do they also affect enhancer promotability? Or do they affect the activity of the enhancer without affecting the looping? Or do they affect both modalities? So this is the kind of central question of our work. So how did we do that? So we, first of all, needed to have some kind of source of natural genetic variation. We are looking at humans. Uh, we are recruiting, we have recruited a panel of 34 healthy donors, isolated monocytes from their blood. And in these unstimulated monocytes, we're going to look at several data modalities. Yes, we're going to look at enhancer promoter contacts at EQTLs. Yes, so that's important because that allows us to significantly enrich um, the or increase the resolution and coverage of detecting these contacts compared with the conventional way of detecting contacts by high C. We can use capture high C, right? So capture high C is essentially a bolt-on on high C where you generate high C libraries which are very rich and you know you need incredible amounts of sequencing to sequence them fully, and then you use sequence capture post hoc to enrich high C libraries for pairs of interacting fragments that involve regions of interest. The typical application of capture high C is promoter capture high C, and that's not what we've used here, kind of. Uh, we've captured promoters of e genes, but importantly, we've also captured EQTLs, and we've captured them in a manner that we can actually read, we have these EQTLs in the high C reads. Uh, so we can actually use within individual uh, detection of allelic imbalance uh, at, in the contacts. Okay, so we have to be very selective uh, for the EQTLs uh, to be able to do that uh, because not all sequences would be detectable in high C reads, right? So we focused on about 1,000 distal EQTLs that we took from a very large and high powered analysis of multiple blood cell types. So we're going to work with, we're going to look at these 1,000 EQTLs in trying to ask uh, the question that I just mentioned. So the additional annoyance in population genetics analysis is linkages equilibrium, right? Correlated effects uh, between multiple variants, which may actually localize quite far away from each other up to 50 kilobase pairs away. So when you when we talk about an EQTL, part of the reason why it's called a locus, not a variant, is because actually initially you see quite a lot of SNPs that behave in the same way with respect to a molecular phenotype. Um, and you need to then do some kind of fine mapping. So what we did. We took the most associated SNP, wherever it was, out of the SNPs in, that are linked together. But also we took SNPs in tight linkage equilibrium with them, with the lead SNP, that intersected uh, known regulatory regions. And we also uh, captured the promoters of target genes. So this design now allows us to profile the contacts between EQTLs and their target E genes at high coverage and resolution. And the increase in, and in coverage compared with conventional high C, if we're looking for the same context, is about 35 to 50 fold. Okay. So then we also needed to profile enhanced activity across individuals. And for that, uh, we focused on ATAXI, so using accessibility mainly as the proxy for activity. And we also used RNA seq to replicate the results from the EQTL meta analysis that we used initially to design our system in our smaller cohort. And this is not as high powered, definitely. So we just looked for the direction of effects. We're not discovering EQTLs here. We have a much um, more powerful resource for that. Okay, so we've performed all of these uh, assays across 34 individuals. And in particular, for capture high C, this is no mean feat. I mean, it, it's complicated. And that was the major limiting factor as to why we have 34 individuals and not you know, 340, for example. Um, so first, we just took all the data from all individuals and merged it together into one big reference panel, if you like, or one big reference sample. And we asked a very simple question, you know, whether we actually detect loops between EQTLs and their target genes in general in, in the kind of reference sample. And the answer is yes. Uh, here are two examples, you know, you, the, the viewpoint is, so that's how capture high C data often depicted. This is the viewpoint with the captured EQTL, and these are the read counts corresponding to contacts with different restriction fragments. Here it's 500 base pairs each way, but we are looking across the whole genome. 
And uh, you can see here, there's a clear contact with the promoter of the E gene of the CQTL. And here there's also uh, like that. So these are just examples where we really see very strong contacts. Overall, um, I, you could see maybe there was a label in the slide that I didn't talk through, um, that we also captured some control genes, the promoters of some control genes that are nearby the genes uh, that are controlled by EQTLs that are not known to be under that control. And so we asked whether the context between the control gene, the, the genes that are uh, regulated by EQTLs are stronger on average than the context with, between these EQTLs and the genes that they don't actually affect. And this is true. Uh, this is kind of a measure of context strength. And you can see that in general, it's, uh, we have stronger contexts with these E genes that we know associate with the alleles of the EQTL versus uh, uh, the control genes. So I, based on my previous experience, I want to ask whether I lost anyone already talking about these QTLs. And if I have, please let's clarify that because otherwise there will be a lot of QTL terminology later in the talk. Is, is, is it more or less clear what I'm talking about? Yes, that's good because it's not always the case. Uh, and that's not nobody's fault. <laughs> so, okay. So, this is a cross all 35 pulled together. Yeah? Now let's start looking for individual specific loops and allele specific loops within the same individual. Yeah? So, we split the samples actually into haplotypes. So, not just into like individuals, but even into the two, each chromosome of each individual. Yeah? And we use this, uh, in fact, adapted. Uh, this Bayesian method for detecting QTLs um, for base QTL that can leverage both types of information. Um, here it's uh, just the genotypes, so homozygote, heterozygote, and homozygote alternative allele, but also looking for allelic imbalance within heterozygous individuals. Yeah? And so we did this for each modality separately, so we can now co call contact QTLs based on our eQTL capture high C data. And, we can, and so importantly, these contact QTLs will only be called at our candidate regions of interest. Yeah, so we have at most 1,000-ish, because we only focus on those 1,000 uh, regions. And then also genome-wide, we detected chromosome accessibility QTLs and replicated uh, gene expression QTLs, eQTLs. Okay? Cool. Now, let's start with contact QTLs. We detected genome-wide 19 contact QTLs overlapping the EQTLs for nine genes. Is it a lot or is it little? Well, first of all, it's out of 1,000. So before you are shocked, <laughs> so it's, it's not that little. But of course, it's actually quite little because we are underpowered. And I'll get back to this later, how we mitigated that. But let's start with these 19. So here are some examples. This is the gene I've just shown, our favorite uh, THBS1. And you can see that uh, for THBS1, the alternative allele is associated with stronger chromosome loop between the EQTL and the promoter. And here's the opposite example. Here, the alternative allele is actually associated with weaker chromosome looking. I mean, that's it's just a matter of what the reference genome is calling the reference allele. The direction doesn't matter. For attack QTLs, we detected a lot of them genome-wide, but again, we are only focusing on those uh, for which we would have the corresponding uh, contact information. For them, we um, have about uh, 13, 1400. Uh, indeed, ataxic is a higher power, let's say, in terms of the read coverage. So it's not just the matter of there being genuinely more such variants. It's also about detectability. Okay, but what's very important is that the majority of contact QTLs are also QTLs for chromosome accessibility, right? And they're also, as by design, uh, QTLs for gene expression. Yeah, so basically, uh, despite all issues in obvious power, etc., we can really see that typically, but not always, if a variant affects chromatin looping, it also affects enhanced activity in a cis. Um, here is an example, uh, again for THBS1 locus, so we don't jump between examples, even though we have more. Um, you can see that there's a stronger uh, loop between this uh, EQTL containing region and the promoter, and also there's a much stronger attack signal as well in this locus. So is this always this way that, you know, the direction of effect is the same, right? Because it doesn't really have to be. We're just asking, you know, is there an association 
but there's a direction of association always the same. In the majority of cases, it's the same. And we have also included some a third kind of public third party QTLs for histone marks here. In the majority of cases, if there's a contact QTL that, you know, with the alternative value, for example, associated with stronger looping, this allele would also be associated with stronger gene expression, stronger chromosome accessibility, and stronger histone marks. Uh, but not always. And there are some interesting exceptions that I'm going to talk about later. Okay, but yes, predominantly it's consistent, and clearly, even when it's inconsistent, we often have uh, shared effects. And so we thought, well, that's actually uh, quite useful from the statistical point of view, because that means that maybe we can focus on detecting uh, variants that are associated with all three modalities and do it with a higher power. Yeah, so let's put aside, you know, the exceptional cases that we can't really do much about, where it's like just contact and expression, but let's ask, can we detect UTLs, variants, yes, that associate with contact, accessibility, and expression jointly, and increase the statistical powers through doing that? And so for that, we adapted a different Bayesian framework called GAS, uh, which actually was designed for kind of a similar task, for example, uh, uh, detecting variants that exert effects on expression across different tissues. That required some tweaks, but uh, in general, this is uh, essentially using it uh, as intended. Um, so we, rather than, so here, this framework actually cannot look for within individual effects of heterozygous. It, it cannot look for allelic imbalance. So we kind of lost some of the power this way, but you know, tough luck. Um, what we did here, we instead looked for sometimes groups of SNPs that have this effect rather than one. So we define these windows where there's a peak, there's a contact, and there's a distal gene um, that we know associates with uh, some variants here. And we are trying to understand whether a subset of variants within this window can explain all three effects jointly. And it turns out, as actually expected uh, from some other analysis using just more standard analysis of covariance, that you can and you will increase the power of detection quite a bit by doing this. And so we call them trimodal QTLs, yeah? Uh, so uh, we detected uh, over 600 such trimodal QTLs. Uh, the numbers may not fully make sense to you because there are all sorts of complicated one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships with, within each tested window, but I think the most important um, number here is that, yes, we have 600 variants that we believe associate with all three modalities, uh, all three modalities. And typically per window, it's just one variant that can explain all three effects, even then sometimes we have more, okay? And is it some kind of black magic? Well, it's actually not. If we compare the marginal, um, say, Z-scores uh, for association uh, for each modality that were produced by this uh, guest framework that does joint detection, and those that were produced by our previous framework that does single modality detection, they correlate extremely well. It's just that when you merge them together, you, you, you boost power. So now we have 600, okay, and we can work with them. That's, that's much more exciting because we can ask, do they share some properties um, with respect to the underlying features? And so the first question we asked was simply where do they map with respect to the location of known transcription factor binding sites detected by chromosome IP? So there's this very interesting resource that I think comes from Marseille, if I'm not mistaken, the REMAP project, um, which has uniformly processed a lot of transcription factor chip data. So we took advantage of it, and we asked the question this way. We asked whether our 600 trimodal QTLs are enriched for the binding of any transcription factor compared with all expression QTLs. Because, you know, expression QTLs are not necessarily primary. And also, they're not necessarily, we're kind of fine mapping here, right, in some way, because you would have a linkage equilibrium block, and, uh, you know, some of the EQTLs may be spurious with one causal there. Now we know much more proximally that they affect some molecular uh, phenotypes. And so we have kind of fine mapping. We would expect some enrichment compared with all the EQTLs. And indeed, we do. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, so you can see there is a list, of, some of them are transcription factors, some of them are chromatin modifiers that are enriched at trimodal QTLs compared with just expression QTLs. Um, and they all express the monocytes, even though we didn't restrict for monocytes when we did this search. So this kind of, I think, really suggests to us that we have detected something functionally 
meaningful. Okay. So if if so, let's now ask what these QTLs actually do, right? So this is just colocalization. There's no allelic color analysis here. It's just, you know, these variants map next to transmission factor by themselves. But do they actually affect uh, transmission factor by themselves? Yeah? Well, to use this kind of approach for that, you would need to do lots and lots of multi-individual uh, chips. Uh, we did publish one study with the Costa Ransa where we did multi-individual chips for one transcription factor, but that took a lot of work. So uh, we decided not to go there for now. And instead, we took advantage of deep learning predictors of transcription factor binding. Yeah, so we used Informa, which uh, essentially is pre-trained on lots and lots of different genomic tracks, which could be expression, but it's also chip data. And you can feed it a sequence and it would give you the prediction of chip signal at that sequence, taking into account a massive window around that sequence. Yeah? And so we fed it two different alleles of the same trimodal QTL, and we compared the predictions. And uh, there are a lot of tracks in there on which it was pre-trained, so 1,400 um, tracks for, I think, 600-something transcription factors. And so, yes, we computed these binding perturbation scores, by comparing the informal predictions for the reference and alternative allele. And then we needed to understand their statistical significance, and that's a tricky question. And yesterday's keynote is a very important uh, reminder that's a very tricky question. But so what we did is we estimated the significance by just sampling completely random SNPs from DB6, most of which have no regulatory potential or server, and asking how much would they perturb uh, the predictions, or would they be predicted to perturb transcription factor binding? And, uh, then computing permutation p values essentially uh, based on that. Okay, so what do we get? Uh, we get that a significant minority of our variants are predicted by informer to perturb transcription factor binding, first of all. Now, of these, interestingly, the majority perturb the binding of more than one transcription factor. And the absolute majority perturb the predicted binding of one or more of these three guys, just three, all of which are very important in monocytes, even though we didn't restrict again for any tissue affiliation at all. So it's P1, PU1, I mean, PU1 in monocytes is a key um, in a master myeloid regulator. GAPPA is also very important, another ETS fabric transcription factor, and CTCF, the architectural protein, which you would expect to affect uh, looping, yeah? But there is a twist, I'll, I'll show you. Um, so, interestingly enough, and I think it's also relevant, both PU1 and GAPPA were previously implicated in enhancer promoter looping, even though, if you think of the mechanism, I mean, they're not looping factors at all. They're not boundary L factors either. But, you know, anecdotally, deleting these guys or their binding sites, it was found that they actually are able to affect enhancer promoter looping. So this is potentially, is it five minutes? Perfect. This is potentially relevant. So we asked, okay, let's focus just on these three guys. And, you know, we have informal predictions, but they also have, you know, very well a defined sequence motifs. So can we do it the old fashioned way? Yeah, let's ask whether these variants actually directly perturb the sequence binding motifs of these factors. And the answer is no, they don't in the absolute majority of cases. Now, is this some kind of magic, you know, non canonical weird stuff? And I actually don't believe so. Because first of all, let's just focus on other informal remind. Yeah, I told you that you know in the majority of cases there's more than one predicted perturb transcription factor. Let's just ask whether the motifs of the other predicted perturb transcription factors are disrupted by these variants. And actually, a very significant chunk of these variants does that. Yeah. So what does it mean? Right. It means that we are, you know, well, I said that, but it also means that potentially we have some cooperative binding phenomena here. Right. Potentially, uh, transcription factors help each other bind, and you know, even a sequence-specific transcription factor can be recruited uh, to DNA by means other than a strong sequence motif through cooperation with other transcription factors. And it may well be that you know, in each different case, you know, some other transcription factor is recruited, uh, is disrupted, right? And then, therefore, its binding partners cannot bind either as well. I think the most surprising result here would be for CTCF, because we're all used to having a canonical CTCF binding motif, and we are used to CTCF being uh, recruited to this motif in a tissue invariant way. 
This is true for a large number of such cases, but there's also ample evidence of what's called the dynamic CCR binding to enhancers in described in phenomena such as hemopoiesis, cancer, etc. Uh, so it may well be that CTCF, where it's predicted to um, be perturbed and uh, we don't see the motif, is also just reacting to um, uh, changes in enhancer activity. But we, of course, this is a prediction, so this may also be informer mistakes. We really cannot rule this out, and what we want to do is for CTCF to try this out and see whether we can see it by chip. But in conclusion, um, here, uh, for shared genetic events on enhanced activity, connectivity, gene expression, we believe that they can be mediated by changes in the binding affinity for a diverse range of transcription factors, and these uh, changes in the binding affinity may in turn have some knock-on effects on the cooperative binding of other transcription factors. So quite a non-specific picture. So in, before I close, I want to tell you about one exceptional case where the story is very, very different. There is a contact EQTL that is not trimodal because it doesn't associate with chromosome accessibility, where we are seeing a decrease in looping associated with an increase in gene expression. And we have looked at informal predictions, and it believes that looping decreases when CTCF binding is decreased, and that corresponds to an increase in expression. So then we looked at the motif, and actually that's very clear why. You know, it directly disrupts a very conservative uh, position in the CTCF motif. So, okay, so it disrupts the CTCF binding properly by a genetic means, unlike the examples I talked about previously, and that results in an increase in gene expression. How could this be? So we started looking very carefully at this locus and we realized that so this is the region where we have the QTL, okay? This is the promoter of the gene that it associates with PCK2. And so you can see that in the reference phenotype, in the, sorry, genotype, there's a very strong loop between the CCF site and the promoter, which pretty much disappears in the alternative allele where the CCF site is gone. But what we're seeing in parallel is that here, the context between the promoter and the more distal enhancers are enabled, which associates with an increase in gene expression. So in some way, this is a textbook case because CCF may form boundary elements. That's you know, a classic function of CCF that prevents uh, the context between things that are crossing that element and, and the gene, right? So we think that that is what's going on here. So it's a rare case, but it's very clear that if you directly disrupt the canonical CCF binding motif, you can get a very clear effect. But this effect is kind of entranced in our case to the enhancer, right? Because the enhancers that are, that are affected are probably these guys. It's their contacts with the promoter that are weakened by that boundary element, whereas the site and the EQTL is here. And that's why it's potentially not an attack peak, because it's not really an enhancer. And by the way, it's not a top boundary either. It's some kind of subdomain. So in conclusion properly now, shared genetic effects on enhanced activity are probably common and are caused by a variety of mechanisms. But you can also have a context-specific genetic effect on gene expression, potentially through enhancer and activation. And that is likely rare. Okay? Do I still have a minute or so? No. In which case, I will not talk about the theory of that, and I will just conclude by thanking everyone involved, and in particular, Helen Ray Jones, who uh, did a lot of this work and is really the, the driver of, of this project. And I will also say that there are two independent studies on this topic that are represented at this conference. One is a Ferrat's talk later today, and the other one is a poster uh, by Chen Fushi, and I suspect it might be down, the poster already, so just find him if you're interested. Can you guys hear me? So, great talk. So I'll, I'll start with a very quick question in terms of your informer. Uh, when you do that, when you find your null set, your uh, sampling from all the snaps, have you done that using sampling from EQTLs rather? Uh, no, the answer is no. Um, any, any questions? Maybe one or two burning questions before we move on? Uh, Martin? Related to that, uh, did you match the earlier frequencies? Yes. Oh. <laughs> it's really quick. That's nice. We can get one more. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Do we have time? I think we do. Uh, yeah, my feeling was that I still had some time, and then we would have some questions. But uh, okay, I had to comply with the chair. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go back to your slides, or you want to? I, 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 I don't know. It's up to you. If you have questions, we can talk about the theoretical implications. Maybe you know, just as a question, I suppose. How? Why do we believe that that might happen? You know, why so many non-specific mechanisms would cause changes in connectivity? Right? And I personally believe that this is potentially. Uh, you know, in the case of cohesion-dependent contexts, I think there's more and more evidence that cohesion could be recruited to act in uh, And if it's so bad, then it could actually promote stronger looping. That was going to be my question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but for afterwards, so now okay. time. Yes, and if and but but the problem is, we and others have also detected the plethora of cohesion-independent contexts, right? And um, and what is happening there, I think, is less clear. But if we think that this is phase separation that is mediating these uh, contacts, then, you know, transcription factors and the core factors that they recruit could directly impact phase separation. And then that would be a direct link. And again, it's non-specific. So both of these things are non-specific, yeah? It doesn't have to be a very particular transcription factor, which is why I said, you know, that PU1 and GAPBA effects on looping, you can't really call them looping factors. They're just strong transcription factors that bind to enhancers, and that might affect looping. So, uh, in, 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 we have a, uh, online question, if you don't mind, I can read that. Uh, the resolution of high C may, may not be high compared with the peaks of the taxi data. Does chromatin interaction anchor may overlap more than one peak of the taxi? Is it possible to assign one to one relationship between a chromatin interaction anchor and a peak of a taxi? No, the, the answer is no, and that's why we have all this complicated business with windows and stuff. No. So, my, my comment on the enhancer is that uh, the, the lack of CTCF. Um, enhancers are, a lot of enhancer interactions are without CTCF at the enhancer, uh, whereas CTCF might be on the other side, and they are where, uh, enhancers are where cohesin is mainly loaded, not where they scope. So it, it is the active extrusion, so that makes a lot of sense that you're finding a lot of other transcription. Factors. Exactly, exactly, not necessarily CTCF. Not necessarily. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, you should very nicely those 12% Right, that you can explain. What about the others? Do you have any gut feeling? Mm. Or any well, my gut feeling is actually we, we trust Informa more than direct motif perturbations in this analysis. But actually, if you simply do a motif perturbation analysis, there are more motifs that are perturbed uh, quite oh, strongly. So you can find yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it could be that. You know, we, we need to think about it. I mean, it can, not that many, maybe about 30% or so. And I, I, I mean, I have another question very specific to this. The loop QTL, but we didn't find an ataxic QTL. Right? Mm -hmm. Did I get that correctly? Yeah. So why don't, I, I'm wondering how the lack of CTCF binding would not give you an ataxic Yeah, it's interesting. In, in a way, there's no attack peak there at all in that region. It was just not strong enough. So the, the accessibility, is not that much increased by CCF rather than that. So do you think that could imply that when there is a really strong loop, there's actually no toxic peak, so you would miss out on those really strong yeah. loops? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I think it was long found that CCF uh, binding sites that are invariant across tissues are often within DNA's one hypersensitivity set. So it's just an exception. We just caught it like that. But yeah, I, I think the, mo the more interesting phenomenon here is not the lack of a taxi signal, but the inverse direction of CCM binding and transcription. Yeah, but then you explain that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other and then there's a question over there as well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a good one. Okay. Um, you mentioned these three factors that come up as enriched, and then you said, like, oh, this is surprising. But I was wondering how surprising it really is because you started with these. You know, uh, immune Q EQTL, so I guess you should do some kind of analysis whether it would really be surprising. But it's not surprising. No, I don't think it's surprising. I think it's actually not surprising. They're drivers of the myeloid yeah. identity. No, no, I don't think I'm, I'm not surprised. Okay. I also I like this business. Yeah, yeah. I, I am I am also I'm a bit suspicious rather, because I think they may also happen to have really cool, you know, strong chip signals. And that's why Informa picks them preferentially to some other ones, but it's not surprising.
Um, yeah, thanks for this for this excellent talk. So one one quick question. So you you said that of these three transcription factors which you found especially rich. Um, so not that often the the binding vote is actually effective, but you found that uh, there are the other the other transcription factors you often find. Yeah, uh, also predicted by informer exactly. to co-bind. Yes, exactly. So my question was, if you look into transcription factor transcription factor binding of those um, co affected You mean uh, known interactions? Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, my postdoctoral work was about this transcription factor collective model, which presumes very lax, kind of loose relationships between transcription factors that may not be captured by these known, you know, dimer formations, more kind of within the enhancer sub model. So I, I feel that it's not necessary for them to be known, you know, dimers, etc. It can just be lots of things together forming some kind of critical mass uh, to help other factors by it. This Chen Fu's question. That's, by the way, that's that's the person I mentioned today. <laughs> uh, we have a very similar data set in TSS, right? Uh, with the uh, ataxic. Uh, for this SNP, I do find uh, quite strong ataxic correlation. Well, in a different, yeah, in a different cell type, you do. That's great. No, probably, probably just a study size. Bigger Possibly bigger size, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. But, so that's good to know. So, indeed, that reinforces Judith's point that it, it's not really. Uh, crucial to yeah to this phenomenon that you don't have to have no attack signal. Oh, that there is attack. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You don't have to have no attack signal. So double inversion. <laughs> you may have attack signal. <laughs> I mean, commonly structural would lack attack signal. So it might if it yeah. fits with your inspiration yeah. idea that this. It's yeah, commonly, but sometimes they have. So yeah. as Chen Fu is saying. Yeah. So my my question is, no one else is anything. Um, <laughs> you, you, you don't get a question. Uh, how much you have I can see people no, leaving I, the room. I, I think you can after. We have still three minutes. Yes, Thanks, Vijay. Yes. I guess just a clarifying question. What's the link between the initial set of 20 uh, contact to the else and the you know, mm -hmm. triple digit? Uh, yeah, we, we uh, confirm most of them. Okay, you confirm. Yeah. And more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then just kind of lots more. more yeah. I mean, in, again, there's some LD stuff, etc. But if you account for LD, then. Uh, so this trimodal QTL idea, which I find very really interesting, did you do kind of like a power analysis to see how much can you gain by this? Or no, you I, I, because now you find six hundred fourteen of thousand, right? Uh, six hundred. No, 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 no. It's thousand EQTLs, uh, but it's thousand essentially LD blocks. There are twenty five thousand SNPs that are being tested. Okay, so this is not the number. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. 